<laughs> there should have been a boot camp to no, no. figure things out. Huh, I'll be damned. Take that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you take your. Well, so, so your is the last lecture. But, 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 no, but let me know. How much time do I actually allow? One hour. So it's not like 50, 50 minutes and then. Why should go for 10? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or more yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay, so <laughs> now it's a bit cloudy, but I think the cloud is supposed to be good. In fact, I'm curious to see how much it's more in the top than right now. Perhaps quite a bit. So uh, we will go for the hike. Um, Tim is calling to the state park to make sure that wash before we start the couple to stand up is not full of water. If it's a little bit of a water, it's okay. Wait, wait, this is a little bit of water. <laughs> this is a little bit of water. Yes. <laughs> um, but the plan would be that after we finish the morning lecture, uh, we'll go um, fade over. To the gear for the height, grab whatever you wish to bring along, hopefully not so much. And, and then we'll pick up box lunches and go into the bus. The park. So our rendezvous point would be the park. I will do a head count once again on the bus, but I suspect everybody is planning to come. Okay, excellent. So without further ado, the last lecture by John Cook. The last lecture. We're not on the phone. So, sort of saying, you'll remember in the first two lectures, I gave you just enough information about the molecules that <laughs> we could start to see what happens when you out the field to them, and we looked at start effects. We started to look at interactions between molecules. So, we're doing that today, and we'll end by talking about interactions in the context of scattering of dipoles. To that end, I will be talking unashamedly about the bigger special law. I will not have time to develop the bigger special law, but I point you to a marvelous paper spearheaded by our illustrious chairman here. Uh, talks all about the bigger special law, everything you want to know about them. I would just kind of cite the results from that. Yeah. So you will recall, well, maybe you won't. I have to come on, man. What is this now? Here we go. Got it. You will recall where we were last time. We worked out the uh, the interaction potential between dipoles. We were thinking in the context of seeing what this looks like in a quantum mechanical context. And so we had we had, for example. If I take the molecule in state one, this is schematic, M, O, and L are not common right? Molecule in some state, and we're thinking about sigma, sigma, sigma states with N quantum numbers and N quantum numbers, but also they're admixtures in a field once we turn this field on. So I leave this general. Molecule one is in some internal state. Molecule two is in some internal state. And this is quantum mechanics. We go for growth and say, look, the relative motion of the two molecules also is expanded into convenient angular momentum wave functions of partial wave, which we denoted this way. And in this case, we said, well, the matrix element, the mean value of the dipole 
interaction potential where these brackets, I mean, take the, the major element of the station I just talked about here. It conveniently and wonderfully factors in the following way. And, and in fact, true to form, true to what we've been doing, I'll put a proportionality concept there because there are numerical factors that are not the point. So I won't talk about all the little details there, but the point is this, what you get is very familiar D squared over R cubed. D is the, di the permanent dipole moment. R is the distance between the dipoles. You get, watch this, you get, the matrix element of molecule one of some standard operator. This C is a, is a renormalized spherical harmonic. This the thing that it stands for the direction of the dipole moment. This is the matrix element of the dipole moment of molecule one in the state of interest. And the same for dipole two, molecule two, C1Q2 in that state, molecule two. And then an extra factor which has the um, the partial wave in it, when there's a different spherical harmonic out there, that gives you that one. So the point is, is this factorization. The, the beauty of this formula is, if you know what the state is, including what it does in an electric field, you can immediately find its dipole matrix elements, and you've got the whole thing here, including the partial wave. Using this idea, we did the following. We took, ex took example one, which was let the molecules be ground state molecules and let them interact in S wave. This is the most basic thing. No electric field in this case. And we found the following. We said, well, if I want to draw potential energies for this, I have potential, I have the distance R, I have some effective potentials here which will ultimately include the, um, the centripetal energy as well as the dipole. And before I have the dipoles active, I have a threshold here, which is say n equals zero, n equals zero. And that had zero partial wave component and an L equal two partial wave component. This is the unperturbed, this, this is the interaction potential of the unperturbed by the dipole. Just the trivial energies, nothing much going on. Up here somewhere, there was another threshold. The one that matters was n equals one, n equals one, and it had an L equals zero, but it also had an L equal two. And what we found was if you ask which matrix elements are non-zero, well, the matrix elements of the dipole interaction for n equals zero, n equals zero is just zero. There was no dipole interaction at all. And we were very disappointed in that because what's the hollow about dipoles? But we go to second order perturbation theory and say, look, this state is perturbed by this state. There's a non zero matrix element between these and these. This matrix element specifically is non zero between states of opposite parity. So is this one. And so is this one if we go from L equals zero to L equals two. This is what we did last time. And the point now is if you want a simple model to carry around in your pocket to describe the situation, that model might be the following. Let's have some effective Hamiltonian. And the basis in which you write this Hamiltonian is, I'll denote it N1, N2, L for short. So I have zero, 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 the ground state. And up here, one, one, two, that excited state. The lower state is at energy zero in this picture. The upper state is at energy four times the rotational constant. That's just how much higher these, these two rotational states are than that. And the electric field comes in in the off diagonal, uh, sorry, the dipole interaction comes in the off diagonal. And the matrix elements there are more or less d squared over r cubed uh, times some numerical factors that we're not worried about. And if we look at it this way, d squared over r cubed, then, then in perturbation theory, what's the potential? How does this potential change? It is. This matrix element squared divided by the difference between these two matrix elements, which is a very large number. And you get, because one over R cubed squared, you get the attractive one over R6 potential. You get the van der Waals potential, which is so important that I'll draw it in red. So the effective potential here is minus C6 for some number you can figure out over R to the six. And that saves the day. So 
So at least I bring two bagels together and then the ground state, at least they have some interaction. It's not that they have a bunch of bagels there. It's a bagel interaction. So be it. This is the, the situation we never, this is where we were last time. Yeah. So you get quantum number is location number. You're, you're saying you can't read this. Because you get to get one and then two is rotation. Rotation of the molecule. So yeah. These are, these are singlet sigma molecules and n is the rotation quantum rule. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is our starting point for today. Any other questions here? Okay, good. So now, now we'll do the following. We will say, I will insert a new slide. So, yeah. Uh, I wonder what's uh, uh, 002 or 1210 this year? 002 is this one. Yeah, I, I'm not coupled from this one to this one because they both have n equals zero, and the backward action doesn't couple n equals zero to n equals zero. In this picture, there's no coupling between this one and this one. In the next picture, there will be. We'll do it in just a moment. So, so I mean, we haven't gone through all the details, but you know, it's also important that, that this thing only couples, uh, you know, also does not couple l equals zero to l equals zero. That, that's also kind of important to the story. So I'm glossing over some of those details and jumping to the result. Okay, so now we'll take example. Whoa, whoa, buddy, what happened there? We'll have example two. We'll do the same. We'll have nominally n1 equals n2 equals zero. We'll have uh, L equals zero, but now the electric field is non-zero. For the first case, you say, well, of course there are no backwards. You haven't turned on the field. You haven't already in the field. Of course there's only one of our six. At best, you were lucky to get a one of our six. So in this case, now the molecular state is, the molecular state goes like this. It's something like, and let's do a, let's just do a perturbation theory so that so that we're um, we're all caught up with everything. Let me make sure this works. Okay, so now I have, I have n equals zero, basically, and it gets perturbed by the electric field by an admixture of n equals one. How much? Let's see, n equals one. Well, in perturbation theory, how much of that admixture is it? It's the thing that does the perturbation divided by the distance between the two unperturbed states. This we wrote down last time. This is how the perturbation theory is the n equals one and comes to the county of the n equals zero in the electric field. Are there missing numerical factors? Yeah, you know, it's 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 my last talk. What are you gonna do? Right? You, you can't touch me. And so now in this state, uh, I have the following. I have if I took the take the matrix element of my dipole operator. This is the thing, this is the average dipole that goes into the form of the dipole dipole interaction. Now, life is good to me because now I will say, well, I have I have zero, and you know what I mean. I don't have to write n equals zero here. You're 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 following, right? Zero plus d e over b one. I have this matrix element C1 Q1, and I have zero plus d e over b one and now life is completely different because now well i know this matrix element of the dipole operator has a vanishing matrix element between the zero state and the zero state parity i know it has a zero matrix element between the one state and the one state parity but there's a cross term now i can take the matrix element between zero and one just fine no harm there and so this ends up being something like, and that comes with a coefficient d e over b times, you know, some non-zero matrix element whose value we could work out, but we won't. There's a number that goes there, but the point is this is non-zero. And so now let's see, but, and this is a big but, if I take l equals zero, C2, uh, you know, this part of the interaction, and I want the matrix element between zero and zero. This matrix element still vanishes. 
unfortunately. Why? Because this is basically all of these things are more or less angular momentum algebra problems. I'm saying I want to take zero angular momentum, add two to it, and get zero. And the laws of angular momentum algebra do not permit this. So this is still zero. Oh my God. What, what does it take to get a dipole out of these things? I put a lot of people on. We have dipoles now. I have dipoles in the laboratory frame. What's a bro got to do? But, but let's see, that was but. So this is but, but. It is true that L equals zero, C2 minus Q, L equals two is perfectly non zero. The dipole interaction is perfectly capable of coupling L equals zero partial phase with L equals two partial phase. That's convenient, and that's what saves our bacon. So now here's the picture. I have in this case the distance between molecules. I have the potential energy I'm looking for. I have an L equals zero here and an L equals two here. And this is the, the nominal N equals zero threshold of dress if you like. And now I have a matrix element that couples me from this state to this state. So now in perturbation theory, hey, you know what? If you wanted a little model to carry around in your pocket in this situation, here's what that model might look like. There's an effective Hamiltonian. And the basis of this effective Hamiltonian is N1, you know, dressed by the field. Let's, let's call it that. N2 dressed by the field, partial wave. And what you've got is 0, 0, 0 partial wave and 0, 0, 2 partial wave, where this, where this 0 denotes this just for the field, mostly zero and a little bit of one. And the fact that there's a little bit of one does the job for you. And what are the matrix elements of that? Well, on the diagonal, you would have zero. And on the diagonal of the other potential, it goes to the same threshold, but it has h bar squared uh, two, two plus one over twice the reduced mass of the molecule r squared. That's the, at any, at any R, that's the energy difference between the two things that are being mixed in this perturbation. And the off diagonal coupling, once in a while I have to look and see if I'm doing this right. Ah, yes, is, is uh, D squared over R cubed times, so that's D squared over R cubed comes from the, the diagonal matrix element. But it also carries this factor for the first dipole and this factor for the second dipole. And I'm running out of room here. So I'll write that as alpha squared, where alpha is DE over the rotational constant. And then same down here. Blah, 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 blah. These squares. Okay, this is one of our including the fact that there's a coefficient that shows the, oh, sorry, that looks like a D, but it is an alpha. This one, sorry. Including the fact that this goes, this coupling goes to zero, the electric field goes to zero. And then, then this requires a whole new slide. And so in perturbation theory, We do the same trick we always do. You go back to this, this matrix element. What's the effective interaction down here? It's the coupling matrix element squared divided by the energy difference. Uh, so the potential you get, the effective potential in that channel is something like, and here it gets exciting. It's alpha squared, D squared over R cubed. That's the dipole interaction squared divided by zero minus the energy of the other state, h bar squared, uh, two times two plus one divided by two. We're not gonna be going to worry too much about these numerical factors, but three reduced mass r squared. That's a mess, but the, the main point of it is what's the dependence of this? So first of all, it's negative because the lowest energy state has to go down. It's one over, let's see. It's one over r to the sixth 
divided by one over r squared. It's one over r to the fourth. So we'll call this C4 over r to the fourth, where C4 is, you know, it's d squared, uh, it's d to the fourth, alpha squared squared, and alpha was d e over b uh, to the fourth, I guess. Yikes. So this is a, an, an interaction that turns on, you're turning on the metal interaction as you polarize the molecule, but in S ray, you still don't get one over R2. Perturbation is one over R to the fourth still. You're getting closer, but you still can't get the bipolar action. And that's going crazy. That's not really Dang it. Still not dipolar. That, that's, I, I see this as a problem. And I'm, I'm really, I'm upset by that. I'm visibly upset by this. Nevertheless, we, we move on. Here's example three. Now we'll have the same. That is to say, I'll start in the rotational ground state, but it turned out that each molecule now has a dipole. And I'm willing to have L equals two. Sorry, that's uh, everything is so poorly written here. Um, L equals two. Well, now we're okay because now the dipole interaction actually in first order, we'll have our familiar D squared, I'm gonna put a proportionality, D squared over R cubed, we'll have matrix elements of the molecules, molecule one, we'll have matrix element of molecule two, one Q two, molecule two, both of which are non-zero because they turn what you feel wrong, they really are times this last little bit of whatever here, L, uh, ML if you want one, C2 minus Q, L, sorry, L equals two, ML equals whatever. I don't care what ML is, it's probably zero. Uh, in fact, let's make this even more clear. L equals two and L equals two, and this is non-zero. Q. Where you can where So finally, we can achieve the actual Yeah. Well, I guess you always, I mean, like the partial, higher partial weight is always there. Yeah, that's, that's part two of today's talk. We'll, we'll see how important it is that there. We have multiple collisions. We know that the higher partial weight is going to be. Yeah. 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 What we call it, what I'm really saying is exactly what you said. In okay. any non zero function, I could have that. And then you may be questioning how important that is. Okay. Well, it's about the two. We've glossed over many things. In fact, let me, let me write down the next thing and, and just to show you this. So um, that, that's an excellent question. I, I, I know where you're going with this. Uh, I'm not going to help you with it, but I, I know what you're talking about. Here's example. Uh, what were we on? Was that three? Let's call it 3.5. So, so there's an interesting issue here, which is, you know, I, I don't really have to make a partial wave. I could ask, okay, so I'm using partial wave as a quantum mechanical notation to talk about the relative angle of the molecule. But, you know, I could just easily. Leave those coordinates theta and phi as coordinates and get a potential circle. We can only get a potential energy curve. Uh, this may be what you're alluding to, and it may not be. But here, here's a case where, and I want this, so I, I, you know, in context, I want to say, well, let there be a molecule, and the, the you know, the molecule, the two molecules are in the same state. And so I'm going to have, let's say, 
Um, well, let's say the case we have before, I have n equals zero, you know, n tilde equals zero, by which I mean n equals zero plus uh, you know, a little bit of n equals one, and, and therefore mn equals zero. This is, this is a specific case. And I have both molecules in that state, and I have an electric field that's non-zero, obviously. And now I look for a potential energy surface. And that surface is now a function of the distance between the molecules and also their relative coordinates. And I achieved this by not making the particle rate by not taking the rate of some of the partial rate, but by just letting it be whatever it is. And so that is proportional to d squared over r cubed. It's the, uh, let's not kid ourselves, it's the dipole matrix element of the first thing. The thing we've been calculating before, I'm just giving it a name now. The dipole matrix element of the second thing. And then without taking the matrix element, the rest of the dependence is C2 minus Q of theta and phi. But here's the thing. If MN equals zero and sorry, MN1 equals zero and MN2 equals zero, it turns out that Q is also equal to zero. Basically, by conservation of I did talk about it. Q is not going to transfer an angle. But there, there's definitely a conservation of some of all the unfine numbers is equal to one. And in that case, you know, what is this mysterious? Uh, this mysterious C2Q, where Q is equal to zero. It's just a notation now, but you know what it is? Here's what it is. It's one minus three cosine squared theta. And there you are. And consider what your interaction is for a particular set of molecular states, any moments that are polarized, then you get the familiar one. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, if you do something else and you care about maybe the one that you want to go to different states with different ends, then you can look at different shapes for you know, different values, functional different form, and then whatever it does. Okay, so the, so the point is, once you polarize the molecule, you're not going to actually do it. Yeah, so I mean, following, following up on that, L equals 2, C2 minus 2, L equals 2. The fact that it's on both sides, what you're telling us here is that if you just actually yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this case, uh, yeah, and so, so actually, you know, what, what is L equals zero? Maybe it's L equals zero. zero. We, this operator, well, L equals zero is an end This function, uh, n equals zero, excuse me, over it, that's why that makes it L equals zero. But if I think L equals two, they both have this same shape also, and that does not appear. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's that's the basics of the interaction. Oh, there's one more thing. There's one, there's, there's one more thing. You're gonna love this. But, but what about the I think it's not, but what L to the zero and L to the two. Okay, but that, that's that's because, that yeah, that, off the end. That's, that's off the end. Yes, yeah, so I'm not talking about that here, but but uh but it will be important, right? Because it really is true that right when interactions are anisotropic and do not preserve L to change L. And those on diagonal matrix elements are, are how that occurs is on the here. I don't see something like that in the scattered way. Uh, uh, no, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, so, any L uh, in general, not very matrix elements to, to itself, or to L plus 2 or L Not beyond that. Why? Because the matrix element. Uh, uh, See, it must have been written down somewhere. Let's go back to this. This one. Here's the matrix element we're talking about. And again, ultimately, it comes down to angular momentum now. So if I have L here and L prime here and two here, that means that these two angular momentum have to be within two of each other. So there's a selection over that. But you see the problem. You know, with, with, if I take zero, there's one there, I'll go with two. That two is important. I'll go with one. I'll go with one. You're trying to hold that soft at some point. That's the thing. We were talking about this at breakfast. Uh, so that, that's the next thing to get into.
Oh, no, no, there's, there's one more thing. And I can't, I can't help but talk about this. This is example, see, draw, draw, partner. This is example, it must be on four by now. Let's call it four. four. So in this case, so everything we've talked about so far, if it's molecules in the ground state, what you can do the following also. You can say, let the first molecule be in the first excited state and the second molecule also in the first excited state. And there's an electric field on, in which case, of course, these are not just any one, they're polarized by the excitation state. And we understand that now, and I'm not gonna deal with that too much. And, and let's say, suppose this is nearly degenerate with some other state, not merely, nearly, Gesundheit. nearly degenerate, meaning has nearly the same energy, with another state, and that state has n equals zero and n equals two. This sounds ridiculous, but this is the thing that actually happens, and I'll show you this in a minute. Then what you've got is um, they are polarized, and if I, if you wanted to carry around some hardware in your pocket, let's talk about this. We know how to do it now. Uh, we'll have an effective Hamiltonian, which is in the basis of you know two molecules in one one and zero partial wave, or molecules in zero two and two partial wave, which is what's required for the recovery. You understand what you're going to and on the end. Then I have on the diagonal, I have what are, whatever the energy of one, one was. I have whatever the energy of two, two is, two, two. And in the off diagonal, I have, I have whatever. I have D squared over R cubed, probably times alpha squared as well. And the same thing down there. But the point is there's an off diagonal, one over R cubed. It gives you that. And now I ask, what's the effective potential in the one one state? It is in perturbation theory, something like d squared alpha squared over r cubed squared divided by the energy difference of the state I'm in minus the energy of the state that's perturbing. Now, here's the thing. The same blah 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 as the score of our squared energy and the one as a sign thing, a sign issue. If if the one one state is lower in energy than the whole state, that's two zero. I'm sorry. That's I wrote that completely wrong. Uh, I humbly apologize. If the if the energy of two any one state is lower than the energy of uh, zero and two, then this is negative. And it becomes a super duper big attractive interaction if these energies are very close. However, if the energy of the one one state is slightly higher than the energy of a two a zero and a two, then this is positive and it becomes a super duper repulsive van der Waals interaction. And that's the thing that you can change, presumably, if you have control over the uh so, so this is just just to say this is attractive. If E11 is less than E02 and repulsive, repulsive if E11 is bigger than E02. Okay. And it happens. This is a real thing. Check this out. This is the picture we had on Monday. This is just I think it, with the energies of a, of a single molecule as a function of the electric field. Here's the one zero that we're talking about. It goes up and then eventually it goes down because, because all things in life ultimately go down. When I look at the rest of the spectrum, I've got, here's the n equal two state. Of course, it's much higher than n equals one and it goes up for a while. Uh, I guess that's the point. It goes up for a while and it continues going up longer than this state does. And here's the zero state, which is all down, 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 down. And so if I consider pairs of molecules, they look like this. 
I don't know why the scale of this figure is what it is, because most of this is used with information. But here I have the energy of two molecules. In this case, they happen to be rubidium strontium molecules. I don't know why. It's just one of those things. That's, that's that guy. Oh, here's the electric field. This is the ground state. Both molecules are in the n equals zero state. That's all down, down, and down. Here's one of the ground state and one of the n equals one. It does whatever it does. Here's the state we're interested in. Two molecules at n equals one. And it goes up and up and up. And here is the, the initial energy for the zero and two. And it goes down, down, down. And right there, they cross. So indeed, there's an electric field where the state we care about is lower than the perturbing state, and another field where the state we care about is higher than the perturbing field. And this has consequences. I mean, not theory consequences, because who cares, right? This has consequences in a laboratory. Oops, let's see, how do I? Um, there are potential energies, Actually, a two channel problem, right? The, the profit model you're carrying around an approximation. I, I'm hoping to make that really, really super clear. There are potential energies. And then there's data. Look at this. This data comes from uh, the favorite molecule of every one of two people in this room. And it comes from the, the lab of Juni and Joa. And what, what is this? This is the electric field on this axis. This is the rate constant for two rubidium. Uh, two KRE molecules to come together and react to whatever it is. The rate is high, and the rate uh, is, is more or less independent of electric field for a long, long way. What are you going to do? There's nothing going on. And then all of a sudden, hello, what's this? Here's a, a magic field where, and these molecules, sorry, these molecules are in the N equal one stick. This is the key fact for us. You get a certain field, these molecules are just below the perturbing state. And the C6 coefficient becomes a whopping big attraction. And because of the whopping big attraction, the rate goes up. You get more reactivity or whatever it is they're doing down there. But you cross the critical field, and suddenly the states you're in are just above the perturbing states. Sorry, just, uh, yes, just above the perturbing states. And you get a whopping big repulsive C6, and the rate drops way down to here. So this is this is the electric field to shield the other molecules to prevent them from doing the awful thing that they put them to do by turning their own dipole moments against them. We win. We beat the molecules in this case. And if you're Jun Yi, you say, look, look, it was, you know, it could get as high as this or it could get as low as this. They're suppressing reactions like three hours of magnitude <laughs> instead of instead of what I might have said, well, here's the natural rating, you suppress it for that. But, but that's and, and, and wait, that's a lesson uh, about being with them. You can try to remember that. Okay, so there's there's that. That's that's the interaction part. Uh, compared to going standard now, but very much the same. Oh, because because there's more detail. Um, because you know it's not one crossing, but several crossings because of. Whatever else is going on in the molecule. Yeah, so I guess it goes back to the uh, Yeah. So, like, it's good to suppress the reaction, but you're stuck with the particular state that you're working with. Is that right? Like, it's only in that state and this field that you have to. That's right. If, if, you, if you have something against any for one molecule, you're not going to try. Well, I mean, like, if I want to tune my dipole, then I guess it's going to Yes. Yeah. 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 You have to find something else. Yeah. Yeah. So this, this is probably not as powerful as microwave code. Yes. Uh, we don't really know that. Not very good. Well, that's also in the interesting. Um, yeah, but you can, you can fool with uh, polarization. Remember, um, you know, no, the particular building requires that to qualify. So like it's like it has also kind of special features. Yeah, yeah. So you're you're right. This by itself is not giving you additional authority to be like a fair word of that. Yeah. In theory, does the two peaks go to the top of the Uh, uh. The, let's see. The gray curve is in fact a theory curve. Um, 
Uh, and it looks like no. <laughs> I don't know. There's, you know, you have this picture of the report was six, and see things were bigger, 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 bigger. And suddenly you can't think about them in any way that way anymore because it's bigger. All your explanations are thrown away. What happens there? I don't know. Actually, is that so? What's the effective rifle moment here? Um, so this is 12 kilovolts. So this is right, but then of the people that stay, like it's really a mix of two. It's it's a mix of it's a mix of three. Uh, I, I don't know that I it's, it's it's large. It, it's well, I mean it's, it's on its way for well, well, uh, well, well it's it's it goes up and down. It 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 is large because uh because we're at 12 kilovolts and we're here. But but that state is, but you're not in that state. You're in the mix of that state and the, the two zero. Oh, you you mean right? It hasn't. I'm mixing these guys in also. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That I don't know. If, if you're if you're a little bit away. Some are like this way and then some are that way, so they kind of cancel out. Um. Yeah. That's a great question. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, helping to Yeah, you have to In the remaining 20 minutes, we're going to do all of scattering things. And maybe, maybe I'll try to hit the highlights here. Uh, oops. So, the final topic is scattering of dipoles. Uh, you know, at ultra low temperatures. Um, and and the gist of it is this: you um, we're, we're going to forget about the difference between the state molecules that are polarized. Let's say that the energy is zero molecules polarized in ground state, and let's say we ignore your using the pure to think about chemical reactions, or maybe maybe if you are we're talking about strongly polarized magnetic atoms and carrying, for example, uh, of course these experiments are actually done. Uh, and and the idea is the following: uh, we we make we make a partial wave expansion, and so in I think I think I'm going to assume that you've seen partial wave expansion before because we all stand around talking about S waves and, and P waves and whatever. You have an effective potential, and this. Because, okay, this is this is a story you probably know. There's an effective potential for L equals zero. There's nothing, or there's perhaps a van der Waals potential, or there's, there's something you know sort of weakly attracted there. When the molecules get really close together, other stuff happens, and uh, you know it is it is what it is. We're not going to deal with that. That's non-dipolar down there, uh, and here you have. In a collision sense, you say, this is R, you say there's some energy, which is the collision energy that is measured with respect to the dissociation threshold. So zero energy, energy, two separate molecules, the thing that separation, collision energy, energy just above that. And the thing is, as you know, for L equals zero, there's just an attractive potential here. Two things scatter in the L equals zero partial wave. They go all the way in and they hit each other and whatever it is they're going to do down there, they're going to do it. But of course, there's an effective potential for L greater than zero. And it looks something like this often. There's a one over R squared 
tail in the long range. It goes like this. And now, if you have a collision energy here, if the collision energy is below some, some certain energy here, there's a turning point. And classically, the molecules get this close to each other. There's not a discontinuity in the potential. Sorry about that. It's perfectly smooth. They get to some distance with each other and no closer. Uh, and, and you know, there's a, there's a classical picture of that. You say if there's any other mention, then the two things must pass by each other like this. There is a point of closest approach. The angular is not zero. This is the classical energy point in the diagram. This one happens. So that's the non attractive picture. And because of this, there are consequences. The consequences are. This is the Wigner threshold laws. Um, uh, and I think, well, let's see. You, you all have studied scatter. I'm just going to start something. Sure. <laughs> right. There's a cross section in the elf partial wave, which is whatever four pi over k squared, what's k? Oh, h bar squared k squared over twice the reduced mass is equal to the collision energy. So k is the wave vector, the incoming uh, whatever, times two L plus one times sine squared of the scattering phase shift. Right, I'm using capital L's for this. Um, this is hopefully a more or less familiar thing. Is that the, the, the elastic scatter two things together and go away, and the, all you know about it really is that the initial wave function is more or less sinusoidal. It is now complicated, but more or less sinusoidal to this phase shift in the iron uh, And it goes in, in this way into the cross section. And the gimmick is this partial wave L. Uh, is proportional to the wave vector to the 2L plus one, dang it, I'm using lowercase l, 2L plus one, uh, you know, with a coefficient that depends on what it actually does if the things actually get close together. This is a power law that is, goes, it goes to zero, and right? the spaceship goes to zero as k goes to zero, but, it goes to zero most slowly when partial waves uh, L equals zero. And so the cross section is proportional to, you know, again, ignoring the factors, it goes as, well, let's see, it's the phase shift squared. So 4L plus two divided by K squared, it's K to the 2L, or if you like energy to the, all right, it's K to the 4L, energy to the 2L, and that is, equal to zero unless L is equal to zero as the energy goes to zero. So in threshold scattering, there are perfectly good reasons why only the scattering occurs. This is the mathematical formulation. Uh, this is the idea behind it. Non-zero partial waves, you're ultimately delayed. Non-zero partial waves is go to zero energy. There's no way you're going to get back here. Maybe a little bit if you tunnel, and that's why it's not exactly zero, and it goes to zero as so the power law of k. But in the limit of low energy, you're just not going to scatter in L equals zero partial. Waves. The two things just pass in the night and never see one another. However, here's, here's where it gets good. Oh, good. At last, it gets good. New slide. However, wait, but, yeah, right? We have a, a but for dipoles. Dipoles are special. And in dipoles, you have the potential here. You have, you know, you have whatever's going on here. You have this, this, uh, this leftover one over r squared interaction there. And you know that really the dipole interaction in non zero partial wave is one over r cubed. And one over r cubed admittedly goes to zero faster than one over r squared, the centrifugal piece, but it's not that much faster than the one over r squared piece. And it turns out that the Wigner law for this 
So for scattering of, of a one over R potential, one over R cubed potential uh, at R greater than the classical turning point, here's the classical turning point, you find that there's a phase shift that's proportional to K. Which means it's not an important. Which means that the cross section due to dipoles in L greater than zero uh, is also uh, proportional to e to the zero constant at low enough energy. So that's crazy. Right? So, you know, we, we have this, this possible, awful concept where we say, oh, well, we know, you know, the whole collision is not only an estimate, but it's the only important thing. We know it like that, but we spend a lot of time to learn that we don't really do much, right? Because, and so we started to think maybe that don't do anything at all. And this would be a crisis because so, but, but this is kind of what makes it interesting is, is that now every single partial wave contributes at, at even at zero energy for dipoles. This sounds like a disaster. This sounds like a nightmare. How, how do you do that? In fact, it is a nightmare. Uh, and we're prepared to show right now what a nightmare it is. Um, Skip that. So, so now here's here's how scattering goes. Just want to be able to finish this up. So, scattering is like this. I have a dipole. Here it is, and another dipole. Uh, and I'm considering the case where the dipole at the moment aligns with the sun along the way. Not worried about the internal structure or any other kind of crazy thing that happens. Here is a plain dipole. They are about to scatter, which means that they're relative momentum, their incident relative momentum is like this. They're approaching us. And that could be any direction relative to the direction of that poles are polarized. That's fine. And then, uh, then a collision occurs. A collision occurs. I'm sorry, sorry. Um, and afterwards, the dipoles are going somewhere else. This dipole is over here, and this one's over here, and they have some final relative momentum. So they, they approach each other. And the cross section in general, the differential cross section, depends on both of those angles, the incident direction and the final direction. And you can write that down. You say there's a the, the cross section, Professor Cherbel introduced this, the, the cross section for starting off in the incident relative momentum and going to the final relative momentum is the square of some function that depends on those two momenta. And that function, here's the gimmick. So, so very typically what one does in scattering theory is to make the partial wave expand. And again, I'm not going to do this, but this is kind of the easy idea. The, the incident relative momentum is a direction, and so is the final relative momentum. And, uh, uh, and so there's an angular dependence there. How do we deal with angular dependence? It's always the same. There's going to be spherical harmonics in here somewhere. So there's a prefactor to this. There's a sum over the incident partial wave over the final partial wave and over, it could depend on M, but it doesn't have to. There's a coefficient I to the L. Here's a spherical harmonic, LM, that depends on the direction of the incident relative momentum. Not the magnitude, it's the angle dependence here. And then there's a scattering amplitude, we'll call T, 
which says if I start in partial wave L, I could end in partial wave L prime. That's a function of energy. And then on the out, outbound path, the angular dependence of the final momentum is given by this. And then there's an I to the minus L for some reason. This is not implausible. Just saying, well, I function depends on angle. I don't have four eight actually into your points that isn't in the final. No harm done there. The dynamics is all in this thing, P, the scattering matrix that tells you how the incoming amplitude is angular with an L is converted into the outcome angular. And there's, there's a whole bunch of theory behind that. So, uh, uh, we'll do another one. So there, there are two options for this. Well, okay, sorry. Uh, let's put it this way. So we note that L prime is either equal to L or L plus or minus two. This was addressed earlier, just like a selection rule, but a matrix element is not correct. Something we just saw or alluded to in the case. I have now the situation where every partial wave is relevant to the scattering, and moreover, partial waves are coupled to nearby partial waves. Every possible thing. And so there are two options here. One is we do a numerical calculation using what's called the close coupling formalism that Professor Cherwell talked about. And I think I think maybe maybe now at last I remember you just went by saying I heard no, yeah. Okay, I didn't think so. But we can do this. It's much easier in this case than the thing he works on, right? Um, you can do this, but on the other hand, you also have the Born approximation. Now, you're going to go, you're crazy, Professor Bowden. Get out right now. I don't come back because you remember studying the scattering theory and then say, well, the Born approximation is great for really high energy collisions. Do you remember that? Never. Then I'm making a mountain out of the moment by saying this because people don't tell you. Nothing will say this. You say the boy conversation. I don't understand why. Because if I have to sit here and I'm scattered up with it, and I go, hmm, I go by really quickly. So, of course, the fact that I'm scattered up with it is just a perturbation of the way it's going to buy. And so the boy conversation is a perturbation theory of scattering. That works great. However, I'm going to say that already in this case of dipolar scattering at ultra low energy, because of the dipole, the entire scattering occurs at long distance outside the classical turning point of the interaction. So even though they're moving slowly, the dipoles never get close together. And surely the wave function after the scattering is but a perturbation to the wave function that just came in. And this is actually better and better possible. And the beauty of it is, uh, I go back to this formula. Let's see. I don't think we need to dwell on the Born approximation, but if I go back back to this formula, uh, you know, the, the, you know the Born approximation is good. It's a little, uh, so maybe we don't need to use the point. But the point is, you have a formula for it. I'll write it down in another context later on. You can write down a formula for this amplitude T because you know it's all spherical harmonics and that only actually is spherical harmonics. And spherical those functions and you the standard blah blah blah. Okay, you can you can come up with the formula for that, and it works. So so just to show how it works, here's an example. This is this is not a very satisfying example, but here it is. Here's one of these scattering matrix elements to go from uh, uh, from zero to zero, zero to two, two to two, or two to four. Because those are some transitions you can make. This is a little bit of energy for some molecule or something. I don't even know. The, the numerical calculations are the blue lines, uh, and the, the Born approximation is the red line. The Born approximation is independent of energy, so it's just a constant. This, this, and this. In the case of zero to two. Uh, two to two or two to four, 
you can see that at low enough energy, the real calculation degrees perfectly with the Born approximation because of this very long range scattering. For, for S wave scattering, zero to zero, I don't even have a Born approximation. There's no Born approximation for that. It's not perturbative. There's no reason to make a Born approximation. It's just whatever it is. So these are bosons. And so in this case, you know, every non zero partial wave I can deal with in Born approximation. And the zero partial wave, you know, it, it's, it's up in the air. I can always find out the standard range for the thing you're scattering. Uh, and with that, we say, oh, look, let's try it out. This is, this is just a fun picture. Look, here's a case where you make a the Born approximation. And here's molecules scattering the plane. They're polarized perpendicular to this plane. They come in from the left and they can scatter in any direction. And I'm looking only at the plane. They can scatter anywhere. So I look at the cross section of the plane. And here it is. The incident direction is like this. The true, the true cross section for this is this dash line. It would be isotropic in the plane. If I throw four partial waves to this approximation, because I know lots of partial waves are, are important here. It does a terrible job. This is an awful representation of that cross section. Oh, well, I can throw more partial waves in. If I go up to 10 partial waves, it's trying really hard to get to that circle. It goes from looking like a butterfly to looking like a duck. Surely that's a, a forward progress, right? And I can keep going because I'm some kind of masochist. And eventually, look, here's 80 partial waves. Unheard of, right? ridiculous, all the collisions. But here we are, 80 partial waves. It's it's getting much closer here, but it's still going, blah, 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 blah. and it's really it totally screws up the forward scatter. There's a kind of you know, mathematical kind of formal this time, and really forward scatter. I mean, it's really, really hard to get. Partial waves, so it's what we have to do for that energy. Partial waves are super important, and, and yet somehow super unuseful. <laughs> Super ridiculous. The convergence is really slow and, and unuseful. But hold on to your hats, friends, because, because I, I can save you. There's also the plane wave for an approximation. And this is this is about the last point I'm going to make because I'm way out of time. Um, approximation where you say this scattering amplitude that we're talking about that depends on the incident wave and the final wave is uh what is it there's a formula for it there's there's a, there's, there's always pies and everything i i integrate over space and what do i integrate i have the incident wave function a plane wave and i have the dipole interaction which i know this, this is in this case i remind you one minus three cosine squared theta over the, the polarized dipole, you know, times whatever the size of the dipole moment is, times the wave function going out. It's just a formula like that. It's like perturbation theory. It's like, if you want to put it in this way, it's like a fermi golden law. There's an initial state, molecules come in, there's a final state, molecules go out, are taking the matrix element of perturbation, the three miles, there's a density of state, which is implicitly built into the, into the wave functions and, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and that's it. You can evaluate this and just come up with a formula. You don't need a partial wave upon, uh, uh, expansion, which is good because the partial wave expansion is crazy. All right. So just, just to finish off that thought, here's what it looks like. Um, uh, for what it's worth, here, here dipolar boson. There's the formula for it. I have the incident wave vector and the final wave vector. They are referred to the direction of the polarization, which is called E. And, and it goes like this. There's, there's some crazy angular dependence here. It's a worse angular dependence, a more complicated angular dependence than the dipole interaction itself, which is around for 30 years. Uh, and, and here it is, here are pictures of it. Um, it may or may not be worth going through this, but, but anyway, you, you can draw pictures of the differential scattering cross section. Sometimes it's isotropic, and sometimes they go this way, and sometimes they go that way. There, there's a lot going on. And the, you know, the final point to make here maybe is that, yeah, there's a dipolar part that lives in all the higher partial wave, but at the same time, here's the scattering wave. I still have to leave this as a floating parameter because I can't calculate the scattering length in Born approximation. That depends on really what the molecules actually do. 
So we didn't edit a parameter, but that's okay. In many cases, in some cases, you know what that is. But for area, we know what that is. And put that in. Uh, uh, and, and the same for fermions uh, and on and on. And I think I, I'm out of time, so I'm going to leave it at that. But the, the takeaway message is, uh, is one, you know, uh, sometimes a black hole is not a black hole. You don't pull away black hole, you don't know it's a black hole. Sometimes, in terms of interactions, even if you do pull away the black hole, you may not see the black hole. So you see a lantern loss potential, or a little bit of a force potential. You see attraction or repulsion, depending on the things that you're looking at. But if you really know the black holes, they're super complicated. They screw up the ordinary situation of the differential model. And it has to be handled so that you can make That's what I was talking about. Thanks. Oh, this is one. Yeah, it's a, 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 yeah, so but for example, uh, I, I, I can't help saying uh, you can use this as a given to find the A. So we did the collaboration uh, potential with the way out. So dipolar uh, area and you did a sort of visualization where you shift the trap, you measure how long it takes to come to equilibrium. That red map on the dipolar area is going to be high axis operator. And if you use Saturn, you can use that as a tool for us. Presumably, it works for both of us. Yeah, so it's not the same as the other one. Yeah, it's not the same Well, I, I, I don't know what you mean by everything. There's no way we include everything. But um, in the Bosonic case, we use this formula. Uh, and the thing is, yeah, you're right. So this is this is in reduced units. You don't see the dipole moment here. This is in units of the dipole length, right? But the idea of dependence is, is exactly this. This is a floating parameter in units of the dipole length. Uh, and and that, you know, and then you there's a whole bunch of blah 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 to turn that into the dynamics of the actual thing. If you think everything is considered equal. Um, am I even going to play in the science department with the mechanics? How well does this map to the experimental data like reaction rates over polarization? Um, I, I won't say about reaction rates, but um, to, to get back to the, to the previous point, we have looked at several experiments where you do some kind of shaping of the, the trap and you look for repolarization rates as a function of the angle. And I have a picture of one. What luck, thank you. Uh, here's an example also from June's experiment with the KRB molecule. So, this is paradigms. So, there's no scattering to screw around with. But here on this axis is the angle uh, that the dipoles make with respect to Y, the vertical axis in this picture, and, and Y the axis they such. So, they, they do this, they measure how long it takes to re thermalize. It's expressed in terms of some weird parameter here. But the point is, here are the data, and here's the here's the theory that comes from those cross sections. So the answer is uh, it seems to be doing okay. So so this is the so-called number of collisions per rethermalization. Yeah. So there's there's a rethermalization rate. There's a nominal collision rate and sigma v. But you know some collision like a collision that just does this it doesn't help the rethermal. So you, 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 there's, there's a plug track, and that's, that's how you present it. Right so you see uh, all the section that comes in, it's uh, like yeah. so, uh, 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 elastic section. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Roger, here is far. This is really not to say. Oh, well, sorry. It was observed, it was sort of not good enough. This is dealing only with the electric scattering part of the song. Uh, this is the field of shield. So. 
lots of different ways we can have smaller and bigger things. Just think of it, Dan, with my fingers and this this angle this is the angle between the, the, between yeah so there's there's uh um, you know the trap is like this and the dipoles are polarized with an electric field that can be tilted in an angle theta that's this angle but see the excitation is always along the vertical but if the dipoles are polarized this way versus this way the, the, the thermalization rate is different so I'm going to understand the 45 degrees wide is the two collisions thermalized yeah, it's 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 faster there, and it's because you know it's magic. No, it's it's not a magic angle. It's just you know here's forty five degrees, and so in this picture, the incident this this is a map of the collision cross section when they're incident this way, and this picture says that the forty five degrees of tilt angle they come like this and they scatter sideways like crazy. That's really good for rethermalizing. Yeah. Why is it like that at 45 degrees? Well, I don't know, there's a formula for that, but I, that's about all I can say. Good. If there are no more questions, then I think we should really thank John for the presentation. And Juan will set up. Um, yeah. So is there intuitive way of understanding this B to the fourth cross section? Um like even the um, um like, like some 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 of I mean none of this example gives D to the fourth somehow. Um D to the, the, like the, the cross cross Yeah, yeah. So in, in board approximation, wait, wait, D to the fourth for um, dependence on the De dependence of what well the cross section it, it's the, that's elastic static right, right. yeah yeah so so this dipole interaction has d squared in it and this is the scattering amplitude which i square to get to the total cross section so just that yeah so d to the fourth the, the more interesting one is the d to the sixth right no oh sorry d to the sixth that's what i meant oh d to no d to the sixth you can um, uh, you look at the height of the centrifugal barrier, uh, and, uh, and and it goes down because you turn up the dipole interaction. In no, no, case. but that's empirical. No, no, sorry, I meant the D to the fourth. Like D to the six D, was D, D, D. was empirical. I mean, it was kind of empirical. <laughs> Effective potentials. They, that, that comes down. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right, right. D, D to the fourth is just this. It's that one are actually d squared right i mean the paper you and chris tickner had it was d to the fourth right yeah okay and then d to the sixth that was the inelastic. Was the the sixth, inelastic. yeah that's what i remember yeah that was the paper and then that's in a way that's faster because more sensitive because we depend on time at some point right yeah. Uh, for the uh, bosonic uh, inspiration, then does this formula also take into account of the band of wires interaction and everything, or just only the... no, it doesn't. Okay. Um, but the, but the band of well, I mean, implicitly, right? So so where where is band? If if you're if you're in higher partial waves and you're scattering way off the outer turning point, uh, the band of doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Uh, if, if you if you make it thin uh, and and scatter off the whole thing, sure, that's yeah. the general, but then yeah. Uh, at that point, I wouldn't separate that for an hour. Uh, so there's an S wave scatter and about which we know nothing <laughs> except that maybe we have a fit parameter. We can yeah, yeah. We, we tune it and we can stop it. Well, I mean, the, the scattering length depends on much more than the yeah. And, and I think in, in this kind of analysis, that's all you can do. Yeah, there's enough. That's not the thing. It's like lagging draw. It's like you can't get So you put the number of degrees, which is all too long. There's no turn to draw. That's not the basic similar strength. Yeah, yeah. So so that that's actually interesting. So um, there's, so we, we have a paper about this too, where you have, you have here's energy and here's sort of the dipole energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and you look at the cross section, the elastic scattering cross section, it's constant, 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 it's a lower approximation, and then it drops over. So, like, this is like, oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, well, you know, this better than I do. But 
Yeah. But this is not necessarily related to the stronger, the type of energy subtract the barrier that you don't have a turning point. Well, no, there are, this is the, oh, this is, energy so, so this is the point. So this is for a fixed dipole. This is the point where the, where the, this is the energy in which you're above the barrier. Yes. But it's the same, it'd be the same picture if you say, I'm on a fixed energy and lowering the barrier. Yes, some point that there, so, and, and you would still go from the from orange yeah. 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Then, then, then the, the instant your collision yeah. energy is a point, the gate is less than yes. the That's where this comes from. Well, it's it's first association with the biosphere. I mean, the stop is. Sorry, let me, let me get this out of your way. I think we would expect like similar, similar, like Professor Bradley's experiment potentially with very steady bit pause. Yeah, but, but he's seeing also inelastic scattering. Then later they, oh, yeah, you know. And and uh, yeah, yeah. So probably the same thing. I I would guess there's an ideal approximation that would do his job. For him. We don't. I don't know if that's what he's using. Thank you. No. I think.